one in four of us has a mental illness. And if that's not you, then it's probably somebody you know. Our young minds should be safe in the hands of the NHS, but all too often we're not getting the care we deserve. My name is Johnny. I'm 26 years old and I have schizoaffective disorder, a combination of schizophrenia and depression. I was let down by the health service when I came close to taking my own life. I was at risk for myself, so why did it take so long to actually get help? Over the past five months, I've travelled the country meeting other young people who are just as angry about their treatment. My life was like falling apart and I had to beg and fight for this appointment. I do blame them for my mental health deteriorating afterwards to a point where I wanted to hurt myself. That's what they make you feel like. They make you feel like you are a burden. I'll be meeting the medics exposing the truth about a failing system. There are cuts happening everywhere, and the, the people that suffer because of that are the patients. And I'll be hearing from the families still looking for answers. One of the hardest gifts to buy your child is a headstone. It's the final gift. I'm going to reveal just how badly those of us with mental illness are being failed by the NHS and what the government is going to do about it. This is me when I was three years old. I had a happy childhood, but it was also when I began to experience mental health problems. I was 10 when I started to hear a voice in my head. And as a teenager, I believed my whole life was being filmed. At the time, I thought it was all normal, but I now know these were classic symptoms of schizophrenia. Welcome to the inner workings of my mind. So dark and flat, I can't disguise. Can't disguise. I first asked the NHS for help with my mental health when I was 17 but I never got the support I needed. And as a result, it took years for my condition to be diagnosed. One of the worst failures happened when I was a student in Manchester. It was before I was diagnosed and I was going through a serious mental breakdown. I felt like I was being possessed by the devil. I was in the grips of psychosis and desperate to take my life. So I ran out of the house. No escape, the devil is inside of you. No I was walking the streets, completely out of control. Came into this busy road and just remember running alongside it, screaming and shouting at all the cars going past. Eventually I just collapsed and I remember my housemates came and found me and they took me to the local A&E down the road. I just wanted to end it all. And I told the psychiatrist this, but he said there wasn't much he could do. Didn't have any beds available. Just gave me some Valium and sent me on my way. Janie was one of my best friends at university, and she took me to A&E when I was thinking about taking my own life. Wow. <laughs> so weird. God, it looks totally different. I've brought her back to my old student house in Manchester. What do you remember about that night? I think that night was the, probably one of the worst nights ever. So we got to A&E. I was just sat there thinking, like, you know, can we be seen already? And just, we need some help now. And then that male doctor came, do you remember? He spoke to all three of us. And you probably don't know this, and I don't think I've probably, probably not told you before, but he spoke to me and Tom outside. And he said, is there any way he's sort of... I can't remember his words, but we're basically sort of being dramatic, putting this on. No way. Yeah, I don't think I've ever told you that because I don't want to upset you, but I thought, I think what? now... Well, exactly. And I think now, looking back, you'd got to that point, you were asking for help, and a medical professional, psychiatrist, or whoever he was, was basically trying to brush it aside what had happened. I remember saying to him, help me, help me, like, I'm going to kill myself if you let me go, you need to help me. He was just saying to me, 
well, we, we can't really admit you. Um, you'll have to go home. Mm. And I remember I begged him. I remember begging him at one point, being like, you can't let me go home because I don't know what I'm going to do to myself. I just think when you get to that point and you're asking for help and that's the sort of support you receive, how awful is that? See ya. I will do. Yeah. Bye. See you later. I've always felt pretty angry at the way I was treated at A&E that night. To even suggest that I was putting on my, my suicidal feelings, the voice I was hearing in my head, it's just beyond me. And the awful thing is, I know other people have been through that and are still going through that today. And I was one of the lucky ones because I had support around me, I had my friends around me. I know that if I'd have gone alone to A&E and if I'd have had that reaction, I don't know if I'd still be here today. My difficulties in getting help for my mental illness from the NHS inspired me to start researching the problem. And I've discovered 2,000 psychiatric beds have been cut in the last two years in England. I now have an online video blog to find out if other young people are also experiencing problems. I get messages all the time from people through YouTube and they say to me, um, what do I do? I'm experiencing mental illness and I can't get the help that I need. It's surprising how many young people are struggling to get help from the NHS. There's three problems which keep coming up again and again. Problems with GPs, problems with child and adolescent mental health services and problems with A&E. <laughs> If someone self-harms or attempts suicide, they're usually taken to A&E. NHS guidelines say such patients are always supposed to be assessed by a mental health specialist, as well as having any physical wounds treated. But Professor Nav Kapoor has found out this isn't happening in 50% of hospitals. Half of people who had self-harmed got an assessment of their mental health needs, their social needs, what might help and half of people didn't. And so for those half of people who didn't, that's a missed opportunity, a missed opportunity to learn more about the problem, to engage people in treatment, and potentially a missed opportunity to prevent future self-harm or even suicide. The problem is there just aren't enough mental health specialists to assess and treat people in our hospital's emergency departments. I'm driving to Great Yarmouth to meet Emma, whose mental health needs have been repeatedly ignored when she's ended up in A&E. Hiya. Hiya. You Emma? Yeah. Hi, I'm Johnny. Nice to meet you. She's 21 years old and shares a house with her partner, Shanice. Hiya. Hiya. You're right. I'm Johnny. How's it going? Hi, thank you. Cool, cool. Would you um, have a cup of tea? Yeah, please, please. Yeah, I'd love a cup of tea. So, is this place both of yours? Yeah. Yeah, we moved in in August oh, last right, year. Cool. And um, where did you two meet? Online. <laughs> oh, OK, cool. We've been together a year and a bit now. Emma has been diagnosed with bipolar, post-traumatic stress disorder and borderline personality disorder. Every day she takes a combination of pills to stay on top of her mental health problems. I take my crotiopins at night because they're a sedative and I take these ones in the morning. What would you be like if you didn't take your meds? Oh, I'd be a state. I mean, in the past, when I haven't been medicated properly, I'd go into a shop and spend £300 and not take a, a second thought. But if you flip it over, and sort of the depression, you're, you're talking about drink, you're talking about self-harm. Emma started cutting herself when she was 15, triggered by her dad becoming ill, and anxiety about her GCSEs. I think at the time I was so desperate just to get the pain out that I thought that was a better way of doing it, which, to be fair, I could have done a lot worse. You know, I could have killed myself. But when it comes to getting the right care, she has been repeatedly let down by the NHS. How many times have you presented at A&E having self-harms? I would go with about six or seven times. And how many of those times have you been psychologically assessed? 
None. What do you think has been the most serious incident of self-harm that you've um, gone to A&E about? I cut my foot open and had to have ten stitches. I think that was the worst one. And when you leave A&E, when you walk out that door, are you just left to go home by yourself and literally carry on as you are? Yeah. Every time I've gone, they've patched me up, sent me out the door, and that's it. Go home. No referral, no advice on what to do, just... You know, there's a door. If you get treated like dirt, you kind of go from I'm frustrated so I'm going to hurt myself to what is the point, you know, I, I should be ashamed of what I've done and, you know, I, I should probably, you know, take myself off this earth so I'm not so much as a burden on people because that's what they make you feel like. They make you feel like you are a burden. Meeting Emma today has been really inspirational. I just admire her courage so much. She's got such a positive spirit despite everything that she's been through. I mean, if that was me, I don't know if I'd have such determination to carry on. So many times she's been let down by A&E. The people that should be there supporting her and especially assessing her. The fact that she's not had one assessment despite having self-harmed and presented there so many times is just outrageous. Everyone that's self-harmed needs an assessment when they go to A&E. It's just not happening. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. But problems with treatment in UK emergency departments don't stop there. Not being given access to a psychiatrist or a psychiatric nurse in A&E can be a matter of life or death. I've travelled to Belfast to meet a family whose teenage son took his own life after waiting for more than eight hours for treatment in an A&E unit. Northern Ireland has a growing problem with suicide. According to the MP for North Belfast, Nigel Dodds, the suicide rate has increased 100% in less than 15 years. That's a huge rise. Christopher Ferran, known by his nickname Cricky, died three years ago when he was just 19. His family is still devastated by their loss. This is Cricky's final resting place. One of the hardest gifts to buy your child is a headstone. It's the final gift. All I can buy you from now on is a bunch of flowers. It's... Hard. Christopher was your normal, boisterous, cheeky choppy. He wasn't an angel, not by anybody's book, but he wasn't the worst kid. He did have a difficult start in life. We adopted him when he was three, and we tried to make his life as good as possible. Since his death, Christopher's bedroom at home has stayed untouched. And this is where you sleep? Yeah. This is where I feel closest to Christopher, or Cricky. This is where his room. These are new trousers he actually bought just before he died. I actually keep them there. I still have all his clothes. And nothing in this room has changed since? No, no nothing at all. Just as he left it. Christopher had problems with drugs and alcohol. He also secretly struggled with his mental health. His mother, Kate, only found this out after Christopher's GP made an emergency referral to an A&E unit in August 2010. He was in a terrible state. He told them he was going to self-harm. He was agitated. He was telling them he needed help. And they kept saying, there'll be somebody here soon, there'll be somebody here soon. And eight and a half hours later, there was still nobody there to see him. So, in all that time, he never had a mental health assessment at A&E? No. He actually, after eight and a half hours, he was that agitated, he ran from the hospital crying. 
and told him, he says, if anything happens to me, it's not my fault. Over the next four days, Christopher tried to get help from other health services, but according to his brother Darren, his mental illness just got worse. I think if they had given him the help he needed, he would have been a far different outcome, would have been a better outcome, but they didn't help give him the help that he did need. You just think, what if this was different? Would that have caused a different outcome? Five days after his long wait in A&E, Christopher's body was discovered in a Belfast park. He was found at two minutes past three, and it was shortly after that that two policemen came to the door, asked me my name, said, are you Kate Fern? He says, yes. And all I remember him saying is, I'm sorry to tell you. At which point, I collapsed. The health service in Northern Ireland refused to comment on Christopher's case, but Kate believes it did not do enough to save her son's life. They did not help him when he cried for help. And he begged for Ames for help. And they didn't give him any help whatsoever. They told him he wasn't a danger to himself. Well, if that's not a danger to himself, what is? No family should ever have to go through what the Ferrans have been through. Not only did they lose a son, a brother, but they had to really watch him struggle and suffer. He never got the help he needed despite asking for it. In terms of young people, on average, four young people under the age of 34 a day take their lives. How frustrating is it for you? That, that, that's a particular concern for you know, any of us working in health services, any of us working with individuals who might be at risk. Um, and of course, the particular issue with young people is the potential years of life that are lost. So each suicide is an individual tragedy. But for me personally, when a, when a young person takes their life, that, that really is something we need to um, do our very, very best to try and prevent. Over 1,600 young people take their own lives every year in the UK, and the numbers are increasing. Christopher's 18-year-old brother, Darren, now wants to learn how to help prevent other young people from attempting suicide. Is your drive to help other people, is that driven by Christopher's death? Yeah, because you don't want anyone else to feel what you felt, because it is hard. It's, you don't want anyone else going through the pain and going through the suffering. So Darren is attending a hard-hitting charity-run training course called Mind Your Mate. See if you take drugs or you're taking lots of alcohol, right? It affects your mental health, but it also can increase the risk of you ending your own life by eight times. As well as helping young people understand why they themselves might become suicidal, it also teaches them to recognise mental health problems in friends before it's too late. Depression is actually a major illness. And this is where the problem is. When we say things like, are you mental? Are they crazy? They're wired up. Someone who's suffering from depression may not ask for help because they don't want to be labelled. And what we've got to do is, and what we've got to encourage, is for people to ask for help. But what you also need is a good mate who can say to you, if you want to go and talk to somebody, I'll go with you. You can't, you, sometimes you can't do it by yourself. You, most of the times you, you can, can't do it by yourself. You always need someone by your side. And when you have someone by your side, it makes it a whole lot easier. It doesn't even have to be a friend who takes time to listen. A passerby once stopped when I was suicidal and gave me hope. In the weeks after my awful A&E experience, I became increasingly psychotic and ended up in a private psychiatric hospital in London, where I was diagnosed with schizophrenia and depression. I felt like I wasn't getting any better at the hospital, and neither it seemed with the other patients around me. I had no hope. The future just looked really bleak. I thought the only way out of it was to end my life. So I managed to escape from the hospital and I caught a train up to central London. I was on the edge of killing myself, but then something unexpected happened. A busy London commuter stopped and talked to me. It was really kind and compassionate. 
And because he took the time to stop and talk, gave me hope. He didn't judge, he just seemed to listen and understand. And it actually made me feel like life was maybe worth living again. I'm now in a much better place. But through my campaign work, I've heard from other young people failed by the NHS. And the problems often start with their GP. Before I was diagnosed with schizophrenia and depression, I regularly saw my GP at university. She was aware of my previous suicidal behaviour, and when I first saw her, I told her all about my mental health problems. She just advised me to do more exercise and improve my diet. I remember feeling really disappointed. It had taken me a lot of courage to go and see her, but she was the expert, so I didn't question anything she said. It's not just me who's had a bad experience with their GP. I've discovered many general practitioners just don't have the specialist training needed to treat mental illness. I'm meeting a 20-year-old student called Nick, who was badly let down by one GP. We're just about to meet Nick. I think this is him now. He's a huge football fan, so we're going to watch his favourite team, Gateshead, play Mansfield. Is today going to be a tough match? Um, <laughs> unfortunately, it, it may well be. Uh, Mansfield are quite a lot, uh, doing quite a lot better than Gateshead are, and uh, we're just trying to avoid relegation at this point in time. Nick has depression and obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD. The condition makes him feel he has to repeatedly carry out certain tasks, such as washing his hands. Well, I guess it all started when I was about 12 years old, and one of my close friends uh, killed herself. <laughs> and um, for the first few months, I didn't really know how to deal with it. Uh, so life pretty much carried on as usual. And then slowly, when I started thinking about it more and it started affecting me more, I would sort of start doing things in a certain in a certain way, in a certain manner, to try and use them as coping mechanisms. So, for example, I'd start washing my hands a bit more often than I would normally. Um, I'd shower in a special way, and if I didn't do it properly, I'd have to start again. And then got to the point where it was really affecting my quality of life. When he was 13, Nick was prescribed 20 milligrams daily of the antidepressant fluoxetine, also known as Prozac. It worked, but last year his symptoms returned, so he went to see another GP. So I went into the talk to the GP about it and spoke to him about it for about three minutes, explained a bit of my uh, background, explained that it was getting worse and worse, and he put me on uh, fluoxetine, which is the same as Prozac, um, and wrote the prescription and sent me on my way and sent, say, come back in a month, basically. What dosage of Prozac were you put on? Uh, it was 60 milligrams of Prozac. The prescription was three times his previous daily dose. So did they go through the side effects at all? Uh, no, no, I was literally given a prescription for 60 milligrams fluoxetine daily, and that was it. I wasn't told about any side effects, I wasn't told about any health risks, um, and he just sent me on my way, to be honest. Not warning Nick about possible side effects proved to be a big mistake. Ah, the life of a Gateshead fan. <laughs> Within days, he began to feel sick and struggled to get any sleep. But far worse was to follow. I remember one time, I'll never forget it, I was in the car uh, driving home and I just felt like flooring it and just smashing into a wall. And I had to stop the car, it was pouring outside and I just remember standing outside for about 20 minutes, curled up into a ball and I, it was, I just couldn't, couldn't handle it but I was... It was shocking when I read the pamphlet later on, I found out that there was an increased uh, risk of suicidal thoughts, particularly in young people, and I hadn't been told about that. And I, for some reason, I managed to have the self-control or the luck to stop the car, but if I hadn't, not only I would have been hurt, possibly killed, but I could have hurt other people. That was when I really noticed that, hang on, something's wrong here, I need to find out why I'm feeling like this, I, I need to get a second opinion as well. I talked to my local GP at home about it, and um, he was absolutely shocked that I'd been put on that quantity of uh, fluoxetine, and he went through the side effects with me, and he just couldn't believe it. He kept shaking his head and saying, this is, this is not what a doctor should be doing. I should not have been put in that, on that dosage straight away. Dr. Ran Singh works in A&E departments and specialist children's units, where he regularly treats young people with mental health problems. We know that with antidepressants in young people, there are risks involved. 
and you have to take that into account and you have to talk about that with your patients. Difficulty is when you've got 10 minutes to see and sort and decide on a treatment and discuss everything with them, it's an extremely difficult situation and I, I don't think it's good enough. But sometimes, young people don't recognise that the problems they have are caused by a mental illness, so they don't book in to see their GP. I've come to Brighton to meet 25-year-old Elliot. Like me, he's one of the six million people in Britain with depression, but it took him two years to decide to go and see a GP. Describe to me what the depression is like just feel completely low because you don't feel happy, you don't really feel anything, you don't have any motivation. But mine very much was really frustration with myself on not being able to do really simple things. And that makes you feel worse because of the depression. So it's a constant, it's a vicious cycle. It just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. At the age of 19, Elliot was in denial about his depression. So instead of going to see a GP, he turned to alcohol. When I would feel really down or I, I just couldn't feel like this anymore, I would go out with my friends and drink a hell of a lot because it would stop the white noise in the back of your head. It would get, you, you feel a sense of euphoria and you just, feel, you just feel better. You're not better in any way. When Elliot did go to see a GP about his depression and heavy drinking, she wanted to prescribe him cognitive behavioural therapy, also known as CBT. But NHS waiting times proved to be a big barrier. The time frames that it was working was that it's going to be six months, probably, if we're lucky, if we can get you onto it. And we didn't. And that was horrible. Fortunately, a local mental health charity gave Elliot the cognitive behavioural therapy he needed. The end results were striking. I feel great, I feel more in control, and I can get my life back on track now. And that's what, two, two and a half years since I first went to try and get help from the NHS. And I just couldn't get it. Elliot's not alone in being frustrated with NHS waiting times for talking therapies. We know what somebody needs and we're up against a waiting list and we can only recommend that they go on that waiting list and wait. Sometimes we can't access services that we previously used to be able to. And that's because, um, principally, it's because of funding. Elliot is now a volunteer with the charity who arranged his CBT therapy. The Right Here project is creating a website and smartphone app which they hope will help young people with mental health problems make the most of their GP appointment. Some of the main things we found were that young people felt intimidated, they felt stereotyped. Also another thing we found is that young people didn't really understand their confidentiality when they went to GP or feel comfortable discussing maybe like issues especially to do with mental health. Doc Reddy aims to help young people prepare for their GP visit, know what to expect and keep a record of their appointment. Elliot is helping with the design of the app. Can I just say I don't like the FAQ there? OK. <laughs> I really don't. What would you prefer? I prefer it up here. OK, we can change that. <laughs> I think the app Doc Ready looks absolutely fantastic and very exciting. And it's great to see Elliot so involved in it as well. It feels like it's given him real purpose. Having that kind of safety net, those tools there before going in to a GP consultation, I think, from my point of view, would have helped me immensely when it comes to talking about my mental health. Because of the stigma, I've only recently started to be open about my mental illness. I hid my problems from friends and family right through my teens. When I was 17, I even managed to keep my referral to the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service a secret. It's better known as CAMS, and provide specialist care to anyone under the age of 18 with a mental illness. My one appointment with them is detailed in my medical notes. This seems to be the letter from CAMS, and it says, 
He described feeling depressed since 2001. In the last year, he has had a few incidents which he himself says is worrying, such as he lost his entire portfolio of artwork on the train and subsequently felt so bad that he, that he tried to hang himself in the toilet. No one was aware of this incident and he managed to keep himself safe until he felt better. Um, mm. It is incidents like these that Jonathan tends to keep ruminating about, which only make him feel a lot worse. If I was doing that, then I was at risk to myself, so... Why did it take so long to actually get help? Cam's promised me regular appointments, but then I didn't hear from them for three months, and by this point, I'd just given up hope and, and lost faith in the service. And I thought, I'm just gonna have to manage my mental health on my own, and so I did. Chloe is a 21-year-old law student and through no fault of her own, had to desperately fight for her one appointment with the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service. I used to have really rushing thoughts at, in the middle of the night or in the middle of the day or I could be doing anything and my mind would just be, you know, going at 100 miles an hour. I honestly thought I was, like, in my, like on my own. It was, quite, it was quite scary and lonely, but I just thought it was just, who, you know... It was just who I was, it was just my personality. She didn't know it at the time, but she was in fact struggling to cope with being bipolar. I've never heard anyone speak, of hearing a voice or having these thoughts or like not sleeping, you know, I just, I had never heard of it before. I, it got to a, it got to a point where I just could no longer hide it, I could no longer like cover it up, I didn't know what was going on. So, these guys are paying for the drinks, then? <laughs> right, OK. <laughs> Chloe decided to see a GP, who referred her to the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service. But the appointment was four days after her 18th birthday, the normal cut-off age for access to CAMS. Tell me about what happened when you went to your CAMS appointment. And they took all my details and they found my appointment, but they said, oh, but you're 18. And I said, yeah, yeah, I turned 18 four days ago. Oh, well, we can't see you then. Unless it's really urgent, we can't let you see. You're no longer classed in, in, the, in the child category. And I said, yeah, but you gave me that appointment knowing, you know, my date of birth, everything. You know, that's your mistake. It's not my mistake. I literally said to her, well, what if I said to you that I'm this close to walking out into the road in front of a car? I said, what, what, would that make any difference? Well, yeah, yeah, you'll be seen as urgent then. I said, you're saying that, you know, unless things are that bad that I, wanna, I, that I want to kill myself. I can't see anyone, what, you know, that's awful. You know, like, my life was, like, falling apart and I just thought, I can't cope. I really, I just can't cope. And I had to beg and fight for this appointment. Having to fight so hard for treatment has damaged Chloe's faith in the NHS. I just don't trust them, I don't trust anything they put forward, I just don't trust it. I, you know, I'm the one that's kept myself going all, these, all this time, and I continue to do so. It's difficult, don't get me wrong, it's hard, and it can be lonely, it can be scary. I definitely think, you know, this is how I'm going to have to deal with it. So, Chloe. Chloe. Cheers. I've also found out there is poor communication between the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service and the Adult Mental Health Service, which means when young people reach the age of 18, they are often cut off from receiving any help at all. Kimberly is 21 years old and works in insurance. She lives in Norwich and is getting married in November. Are we going to try some, or not we, you're going to try some dresses and I'm not going to try, try the one. The if you want. I'm actually quite tempted because they're really nice and, uh... Just because we're going to this one. Wow. Yeah, I'll try it on. Yeah? Why not? Okay. The build-up to her wedding is difficult because Kimberly suffers from severe anxiety and depression. Have very down days where, to the point where I don't want to get out of bed in the morning. Um, my anxiety in particular is a big factor of my life. 
the depression side of things, I get really, really low to the point where it feels like there's a physical dark cloud over me and there's nothing I can do to get rid of it. When she was 14, Kimberly was referred to the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service and over the next three years, she had regular therapy sessions. But as her 18th birthday approached, her appointments began to be cancelled. The sessions just came to a halt and that was kind of it really. I didn't really hear too much else from them um, and just a line got drawn under it and that was that. Were you aware that you were going to be cut off? It kind of made me a bit angry but I thought well perhaps I don't need it, perhaps I don't need that help, perhaps that's it. I'm not going to feel like this ever again and I'm just, now I'm 18, I'm an adult, like, the world's my oyster, I'll do what I want. And I just thought that I had no limitations in a way. Um, I thought, well, if a doctor doesn't want to see me, there's obviously nothing wrong. Wow. I like this one. I like that one. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Kimberly wasn't even told an adult mental health service existed. She fell into the gap between the child and the adult mental health services. And with no support, Kimberly began to suffer increased anxiety and more panic attacks. I thought, I've got myself into this position. Why can I not just get on like any other normal 18, 19 year old? Looking back at it now, I, I do blame them to a degree for my mental health deteriorating afterwards to a point where I wanted to hurt myself. I have self-harmed. I, I did when I felt really low. You know, and I didn't see any point in anything. And I do blame the, the Child and Adolescent Service for that to a degree, definitely. It's left husband-to-be James angered by the lack of support from the NHS. If someone has you know, anxiety, things like that, they're not as confident in speaking up and saying, you know what, I don't agree with that. Um, and, you know, you, a family member or friend or boyfriend at the time, you know, um, can't say to a doctor, I think you should be doing this. They won't talk to me. They won't talk to Kim's mum, whoever. Um, it would have to come from her that she wasn't happy about it. You know, if someone's already got that anxiety, it's difficult for them to do that. So I, I was always sort of saying, you know, you need to go back and, and, and ask and find out. And, and it was difficult for her and completely understandable that it was. Oh, it's so pretty. And I, I love the colour as well. This is kind of like the, the colours we want. I, I just got completely let down. I was approaching 18 and they just cut me off. It's awful and to think that it could happen to someone else is just... that really saddens me, definitely. I found out that up to a third of teenagers are also being abandoned by CAMS when they approach adulthood. When people are transitioned from CAMS to adult services, that transition should be integrated, it should be graded, it should be based on an introduction and a step-by-step -step process. It should involve the young person in terms of negotiating and planning their care. That's the best way to do it. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen that way in many instances. There was a study in London that was done and only 4% of young people experienced a good transition. Only 4%. I think that's a shocking figure. I love the back as well. It's got like an open back. With two-thirds of CAMS budgets in England having been cut since 2010, more young people like Kimberly could end up falling through the mental health gap. I'm heading to the Lake District in Cumbria with some of the people I've met making this documentary, who, like me, feel they've not been given the therapy they wanted on the NHS. With written permission from each of our GPs, we'll be attending a mindfulness course, a new form of therapy which has been approved for use by the NHS to treat depression and anxiety, but is very rarely prescribed. I'm really intrigued. I've never actually done anything like this before, so I'm quite excited about it and I'm kind of hoping that something really good comes out of it. It would be nice to actually have those 20 minutes of relaxation before bedtime, just so I can actually sleep and just to probably understand the way my mind works a bit better. I'm hoping that mindfulness will just give me a chance to shut my thoughts off for a little bit, clear my head and just give me a, a little bit of a sense of inner peace. Supporters of mindfulness say it can benefit those with mental health problems, so it'll be interesting to find out if any of us find it useful.
Oh, wow. Look at this. Oh. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. How are you guys all feeling? Really excited now. Yeah, now really we're excited. Looking forward to it, yeah. Right, guys, should we go and check in? Cool. Mindfulness teacher Karen Todd from Manchester is running this weekend's course. Mindfulness is all about breathing techniques, body awareness, meditations, all sorts of different things that you can apply to your life straight away. One of the best things about mindfulness, of course, is that it's a free service, so really, you know, hopefully there are benefits, financial benefits for the NHS as well, in that um, once people have learnt the techniques, they can self-help themselves using those techniques. There's one person I still want to see who couldn't attend this weekend's mindfulness course. So today I'm off to meet someone called Rachel. Uh, Rachel suffers from anorexia. And anorexia actually has the um, highest mortality rate of all the psychiatric disorders. So it's vital that treatment is really effective. A recent report by the Royal College of Psychiatrists says the UK is not doing enough to help people like Rachel who have eating disorders. Hiya, Hi. you're Rachel. Hi, I'm Johnny. Hi, Johnny. Hi, Johnny. How are you doing? Are you? You're right? I'm fine, thanks. Rachel is 27 years old and lives on a farm in York. These are some of the calves on the farm, and these are a couple of months old. They're absolutely adorable, very noisy, but it's lovely if you, you, know, if you love animals. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't want to live anywhere else. It's, it's absolutely ideal for me, definitely. She's been anorexic since she was 10 years old, and over the last 17 years, her body has become permanently damaged. I've now developed an awful lot of medical problems, such as osteoporosis, and um, I can't have children, and I have um, palpitations, I have problems with my bloods at times, things like that. So it's, it's now my whole, my whole life has completely changed. Rachel is one of 1.6 million people in the UK who have an eating disorder, and she has now become addicted to exercise. So on a typical day, how much exercise would you do? Um, I do about three hours worth of exercise a day, about two hours on this, and then another hour of sit-ups. If I don't exercise, that means that I don't want to eat because it feels like I'm just going to get fat again. Over the past decade, Rachel has been in and out of hospital, but feels her treatment has always focused on weight gain rather than addressing her mental health. I've been to about seven specialised clinics and general hospital um, over the years. At one point, it was about... I was coming to... I was literally coming out of hospital, have maybe about four weeks home and going back into a different one. In my head, all I wanted to do was eat and get out. It wasn't about recovering, it wasn't about fixing things. So at the point of being admitted, you were promised you would have therapy? Definitely. They said that they'd give me um, help with anxiety, they'd give me help with eating, they'd give me psychological help. Within the period of three months, I didn't get any help whatsoever. And I felt almost like I was a problem to them that were trying to get rid of me. Ill health means Rachel spends a lot of time at home, helping run her mum's dog breeding business. So these are oh, my... So cute. Yeah, these are my passion. They give me um, oh. distraction. It gives me something yeah. to do. But she feels that with the right treatment from the health service, life could be so much better. My version of recovery is getting by a day just without thinking about food or just not feeling so awful about myself all the time. My version of recovery isn't being a BMI of 20. My version of recovery is just to be happy again. According to Dr Ranj Singh, the problem behind Rachel's poor care is simple, not enough money. Spending on mental health has fallen for the second year in a row. The tricky part of it is that everything requires funds. Everything requires it. And if mental health as a whole isn't funded adequately, 
all the services underneath that umbrella suffer. And there are cuts happening everywhere. And because of that, services are being changed and thresholds are being changed and referral criteria are changing. So, and the, the people that suffer because of that are the patients that need the greatest care. Back in the Lake District, we're learning mindfulness techniques which may help us with our mental health. The body scan is a form of meditation that can lower stress. And if you just take your awareness now to the top of your head and just notice what sensations are present there for you. Chloe, who has bipolar, doesn't find the body scan helpful. I've had sort of mixed emotions about today. The body scan was the thing that I think really, I really didn't engage with at all. My mind was wandering and then I just couldn't bring it back. I just couldn't really sort of get into that zone I think that you need to be in. But the exercise has had a powerful impact on both Nick and Emma. To have 15 minutes where I wasn't thinking about any of my rituals, I wasn't concerned about my mind going on and on and on at 100 miles an hour, it was really emotional for me afterwards. I, I, I very nearly did have a little cry to myself just because it was that unreal, uh, to have that kind of relief, that relaxation that I didn't think was possible. It was really, really nice to sort of be able to relax and not have to rely on some kind of prescription tablet to do it for me. During a break from the course, I want to find out what everyone has made of their experience with the NHS. They have to remember that these are, you know, children, you know, young people that have, you know, and it is scary, it really is scary. When you're young, you're not only going through puberty, your hormones are everywhere, but no one believes you, no one, because you're like this, and everyone just says, it's a teenage phase, you'll go through it. I've spent the last three years trying to get myself back to a point where I can be even remotely like who I was. I'm, I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm proud to say that I've done it on my yeah, own. Yeah, definitely, yeah. You know, if I'd have mm. waited on them, I'd have been a goner a long yeah, time yeah. ago. As a result of her own experience, Kimberly is now reaching out to other teenagers who might be suffering the way she did, like me. She's blogging about her mental illness. The, using things like social media, you realise sort of the, the scale of how many people are affected. Um, and, you know, and I've, I've, I've talked to, to people who, who were in worse situations than me uh, when I was sort of 14, and it, it's really sad to hear that that support wasn't there. I know that other people have enjoyed reading it, so hopefully it helps in making people realise they're not alone and, you know, they're feeling the same things as what I am. I'd really like to try and make just, even if it's just a small difference, that's what I'd like to do. Someone else taking direct action is Rachel. She's on a mission to set up support for local eating disorder patients coming out of NHS hospitals. I've actually had three, well, four friends die. Three because they haven't had adequate help with leaving hospital. They've come from a unit, been discharged home, lost the weight and died at home. Today, she's going to find out if she can win official backing for her own charity. I've found that when I've told a lot of professionals about me wanting to do this, I've been told not to get involved in anything with eating disorders, that I should disassociate myself with the whole cause. That made me more determined. The Local Council for Voluntary Service, or CVS, has the power to either make or break her dream. It's a body that helps startups and supports voluntary organisations. I'd like to be able to offer a confidential helpline providing both advice and support. I'd like to offer a range of groups that sufferers can access, such as body image classes, nutrition advice and support, cookery classes, relaxation, things like that. If Gary and Natasha are convinced Rachel is onto something, they will be able to provide financial support and guidance to get her charity off the ground. If you could start tomorrow, what's the thing that you start doing? Um, I suppose the, um, the helpline, I think, with that. I mean, I looked into getting a, a separate landline. It was about line. £100 or something like that. Uh, to get it installed? Yeah. When it comes to it, 
is this going to be you spending most of your time on this? It'd be basically um, split between me and my mum. She's my carer. If you were to help more people through this service, the less readmissions there are into the system. By the end of the meeting, Rachel proves she has an impressive idea. We'll do a bit of like an action plan. That's things lovely. That we think are the, like the next step. That's fantastic. Thank okay. you very much. I mean, the one thing that you need to make things happen is drive and enthusiasm, and um, you seem to have plenty of that. So. Definitely. Receiving backing from those who can make her dream become reality is a huge boost to her confidence. It's really pleased me that um, they both seem to be very um, interested in the project, and they think that. Um, it is something that is needed out there. So I'm really happy. I've travelled the country meeting people with a shared anger towards their mental health treatment from the NHS. I've talked to Chloe and Kimberly about the failures in the child and adolescent mental health service. Nick, let down by his former GP. Elliot and Rachel frustrated by lack of access to therapy, and Christopher and Emma, who were failed by A&E. I've now come to central government to put their concerns to the man in charge of mental health, the new care minister, Norman Lamb. NICE guidelines do say that when someone turns up at A&E and they've self-harmed or attempted suicide, they should be given a psychosocial assessment. Yet this is only happening to half of all cases. Many A&E departments, there's no real access to uh, uh, psychiatric support. I've had a case in my own constituency very recently of a mother uh, who's lost her son, aged 27, uh, to suicide. Uh, and he turned up at A&E with ligature marks on his neck, uh, was discharged uh, with some advice and took his own life the next day. A complete failure of the system. Do you feel GPs are sufficiently trained in mental health, particularly when it comes to young people? No, uh, I, I mean, it's a very patchy picture around the country. There are some brilliant GPs uh, who get mental health, who've chosen to do the extra training, uh, and therefore their patients get a great service. But in too many areas, there's an insufficient understanding. Uh, I mean, one of the things the Royal College of GPs has argued for is uh, an extra year of training for GPs, which would include a mental health uh, element, a significant mental health element, and I'm very positive about that and very keen that we actually get to the point where we can implement it, because I think it would make a real difference. Now, moving on to the area of CAMS, in some parts of the country, the transition from CAMS to the adult mental health service is quite poor. Why does this failure of communication between the two services exist? I mean, it is completely unacceptable, and I, I want to look at how we can achieve a much more seamless service or transition for people. There, but there is no excuse for services coming to an end and people being left high and dry, and as I understand, you know, is, is the experience far too often. Well, I've met and filmed with six young people and the family of a seventh who took his life that all feel severely failed by the mental health service. Mm. These are not isolated cases. What is your message to them about the state of the mental health service? My message to them is that uh, I agree with them uh, on their frustration, uh, their irritation, and I'm sure their anger at the failure of the system. Uh, I'd like to meet with them uh, if they're up for it, um, because I, I share their determination to change things. The care minister believes the way to solve the problem is to give equal status to mental and physical illness, which he's just done through the new Health and Social Care Act. But I'm worried that without financial backing, things will never change. Spending on mental health has decreased for the second year in a yep. row. But you say it's a priority. It, well, that in a way demonstrates my point. There is this bias and that's why I'm very keen to get a greater equilibrium in the system so that people with mental health problems get the same rights and that will force commissioners to think well we've got to spend money on that as well but we've got to now uh, hold the system to account we've set the priority now the system has to deliver that sounds good but will it really result in more spending on mental health I just hope Norman Lamb sees his commitments through 
to avoid future failures for young people with mental illness. We're approaching the end of our mindfulness course, a form of therapy which is approved for use by the NHS, but is rarely prescribed. This is called the mountain meditation. This is a pure relaxation meditation. This simple exercise provides Kimberly with a breakthrough moment in coping with her severe anxiety. That worked wonders for me. I absolutely loved that. And it, it was really nice to feel my heart rate actually lower and I'm not like all the time, you know, and it was just, yeah. it was amazing. I feel really good. I just, I know that sounds really daft, but I feel no, really no, no, good. It's, really daft. it's like, it is finally, like, I can see myself being able to do that every single day. It's a great end to what has been a really positive experience for me. Quite sad to be leaving, to be honest. I feel I've gained a lot myself in the last few days and I'm definitely going to miss uh, not just the mindfulness, but everyone here. Um, feels like gained some really good friends. I will never be rid of my mental illness, but I have learned to manage it through cognitive behavioural techniques and mindfulness. I'm determined to continue to help others with my online videos, which are now watched by people from all over the world. It's been quite inspirational, actually meeting all of you um, individually and then coming here together. Um, and I think um, it's a real privilege as well for me to have got to know all of you, and um, I'm going to miss you all. Thank you. Hugs. <laughs> Group hugs. Group hugs. Group hugs. Group hugs. Oh. Let's hope the new Health and Social Care Act results in more being spent on mental illness by the newly formed NHS commissioning bodies. But young people like us will have to see a real change in our treatment to know the new act is working and that we are finally getting the mental health care we all deserve.